Welcome back to another Sound Truth interview. I'm your host, Adam Miller. And today I'm really privileged to be joined by someone I grew up following and reading and watching and even attending conferences with. We're joined by Ken Ham from Answers in Genesis. Uh, there's been a lot going on over the last several years with their ministry. So I'm sure I'm going to let him explain all of the new, uh, the new things that they're doing with the Ark Encounter, the, the Creation Museum, and Answers in Genesis in general. Uh, but it's a real privilege to have him with us as a part of our doctrine series as we're breaking down various doctrines each month. Today, we're going to be talking about the doctrine of creation, a central doctrine that is often overlooked or even disagreed upon uh, based on various different church denominations, but a central one nonetheless. So, uh, Ken Ham, thank you so much for being a part of the many voices for that one message. Hey, thanks, Adam, and it's uh, great to be with you. Why don't you get started by telling us a little bit about uh, your ministry, Answers in Genesis, and how it pertains particularly to this whole doctrine series that we've been working on in the doctrine of creation. Well, Answers in Genesis is an apologetics ministry, which doesn't mean we apologize for our faith. <clears throat> what it does mean is that we give answers to the skeptical questions of our age. And, you know, when you look at uh, what's happening today, I would say that we live in an era in which the attack, the Genesis 3 attack, I call it, you know, Genesis 3, 1, when the devil came to Eve and said, did God really say? And in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, the apostle Paul warns us, the devil's going to use the same attack on us as he did on Eve. So the attack to undermine God's word, to get people to doubt God's word, I would say since the 1800s in particular, has been really focused on the historicity of the first 11 chapters of the Bible. And so we do specialize in giving people answers to those attacks that undermine those first 11 chapters because those first 11 chapters of genesis you know you could call it the creation fall flood tower babel account that they're foundational to the whole of the rest of the bible all of our doctrine to our whole worldview and so uh, answers in genesis publishes a lot of apologetics materials for all ages uh, so we're really emphasizing the bible's a book of history and not only that, we have two attractions, the Ark Encounter, the Creation Museum, that are set up so that we answer these questions using exhibits and point people to the truth of God's word and the saving gospel. And so at the Creation Museum, we have a planetarium, we have a 4D theater, uh, we have lots of exhibits and a dinosaur exhibit, insectarium, but we walk people through the whole Bible, Genesis to Revelation. Uh, we also then at the Ark Encounter have uh, three decks of exhibits and we answer lots of questions about the flood and post flood. Uh, we deal with, you know, Tower of Babel and the race issue, racism, etc. Uh, and we also have a zoo, where, <clears throat> excuse me, where we're teaching people from a biblical worldview perspective. Uh, make sure that they understand about kinds versus species. So we answer how no one can get the animals on the ark. We have a virtual reality experience. And we do all sorts of other programming as well. We have uh, auditoriums at both locations where we actually have teaching programs and we have um, uh, all sorts of other fun programs, live animal programs. So it's all to equip families to be able to raise up godly offspring who know how to defend the Christian faith and know how to boldly share the word of God. Hmm. I want to pick on the fact that you you mentioned that your ministry is based on the first 11 chapters of Genesis and, and making defenses for those those chapters. It, the first 11 chapters of Genesis seem pretty boilerplate, but uh, yet there are a lot of areas where they're under attack. And I think the other side of it is it really touches on every little part of Scripture, too. It talks about salvation. It talks about sin. It talks about the Redeemer. I mean, it really covers a large gamut of Scripture. It does. And in fact, you know, I would say to people, look, if, if you look at the first 11 chapters of the Bible, there's a lot of Christians that say it doesn't really matter as long as you believe God created, you don't need to worry about the details. And I would say, no, the details matter. I mean, there are even people that say, look, when you go out and present the gospel, don't get into the, the, the creation evolution debate or debate about Genesis, leave that out, just tell them about Jesus. You know, we have generations today who don't even know who Jesus is. And you tell them they're a sinner, they don't know what sin is and what it means. And if you were to tell them, well, Jesus died for you on the cross, why did he die? 
uh, well, because you're a sinner and well, why am I a sinner? Well, where did that come from? See, the whole foundation of the gospel is right there in the creation account, understanding God made a perfect world. The first man rebelled against God. We're all descendants of that first man. When he rebelled, sin came into the world. That's why we're sinners. The promise of the savior was given in Genesis 3.15. And again, actually, in Genesis 3.21, because that's really the setup of the sacrificial system pointing to the one who would be the ultimate sacrifice. So the account in Genesis 1 to 11 there, uh, that's foundational to the gospel. Not only the gospel, where do we find out about death? Why do we die? Genesis 1 to 11. Uh, why is there sin? Genesis 1 to 11. Where did marriage come from? Well, God created marriage, you know, not the Supreme Court justices. God did. And he created marriage when he created the first man from dust and the first woman from his side. In fact, Genesis 2, 24 is the creation of marriage. And Jesus quotes the text of that verse in Matthew 19 and also Mark 10, mm. uh, attesting to its historicity and it's the foundation for marriage. But what about gender? Well, God made two genders, male and female, Genesis 1, 27. Why do we wear clothes? Well, God gave clothes because of sin, Genesis 3, 21, uh, when God clo clothed, Adam and Eve in coats of skins, the first blood sacrifices are covering for their sin. Picture what was to come in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why did Jesus die on a cross? Genesis 1 to 11. Why is he called the last Adam? Takes the place of the first Adam. Genesis 1 to 11. Why does man have dominion? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we have to work and today work hard? Genesis 1 to 11. And so ultimately, all of our doctrines are directly or indirectly founded in the first 11 chapters. So the first 11 chapters are key. They're important. Mm. You mentioned in that statement that as long as we, uh, some people will make the statement where as long as we believe that we're created by God, why do the details matter? Let's just step back a little bit. Why does it matter that we believe that we're created by God? Why do Christians even have to accept that as a premise? Well, you know, if you really think about it, the very first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The very first verse is the foundational verse for the foundational chapter for the foundational 11 chapters for the rest of the Bible. I mean, if that first verse is not true, then neither of the rest is true. If God is not creator, then nothing else, um, nothing else stands. It all goes. And the fact that God is creator means what? It means he owns us. Mm -hmm. It means he has a right to set the rules. He has a right to determine what's right and what's wrong. We don't have that right. He is the absolute authority. That's what it means. He has a right to determine what's good, what's bad. It's like in the New Testament, when that man came to Jesus and said, good master. And he said, why do you call me good? There's only one good, and that is God, because the attributes of God defines what is good. You don't define what is good. God defines what is good. And, you know, if you think about what's happening today, uh, I see in, in much of the church, sadly, where people are responding to where the culture is at maybe in regard to gay marriage or abortion or whatever, and then they're going to the Bible and reinterpreting uh, God's word. But you see, if God is the creator and this is his word, then we should be using his word to judge what people are saying, not the other way around. So it really matters if you understand uh, whether or not God is creator and whether you believe God is creator. Mm. I do think that's really important because we're living in a culture where we want to shy away from the the kind of rough edges of the Bible, so to speak. And there's even people that want to talk about unhinging from the Old Testament and just focusing on the New Testament. But there in itself presents some challenges where how do we talk about the resurrection? Because when we mention that we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, people roll their eyes. There is a lot of foolishness if you are on the outside looking in. But if we deny these details, if we try to shy away from them, we're actually denying the power of the gospel. I was teaching this to a bunch of little kids, and and I had to explain to them, I said, you're going to go through a lot of these training in your classrooms, and your teachers are going to say that uh, what we believe is not true, but I'm going to tell you as a fully grown man, I believe these things with all of my heart. I believe that God created the world. I believe that God uh, raised Jesus from the dead. I believe these things, and they are central to our faith. I think that there's a way in which a lot of people sh want to shy away from those sort of rough edges, hard to explain components of the Bible. Well, you're right about that. And, you know, I often uh, I say to people, if I'm speaking to an audience and uh, I, I, I say to people, um, you know, now, do you believe that Jesus Christ bodily rose from the dead? And 
you know, in, in the church, of course, uh, you know, you would, you would hope everyone would say, yes, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Um, and I would say, how do you know that that is true? Mm. Um, were you there? Did, um, did you see a movie rerun of it? Um, I mean, the Passion movie, you know, that's not a movie rerun of what happened. Uh, so how do you know? Well, because the Bible says, okay, so you believe that uh, Jesus healed the sick, you believe he raised the dead, you believe he fed thousands uh, with just a few fish and a few loaves of bread, uh, do you believe that he uh, cured the blind and the deaf and the lame, and well, yes, but how do you know? Oh, because the Bible says, okay, so let's go back to the Old Testament now, do you believe that the Israelites crossed the Jordan River, do you believe that they crossed the Red Sea? Well, yes, they're miracles. How do you know that? Because God's word says. Okay, do you believe the Israelites won in the desert for 40 years and their clothes didn't wear out or their shoes didn't wear out? Yes. Well, how do you know that? Well, the Bible says. Do you believe a man was swallowed by a fish and lived for three days in a fish? Well, yes, the Bible says. But then you go to Genesis in this day and age and you say, do you believe that God created in six literal days? There was a global flood and uh, that... Um, that there are only two people to start with adam and eve made from dust made from his side and then you often hear them say well uh well no today we live in a scientific age because of what science is saying you know uh, we could have come from ape men or um maybe the days are long periods of time or and and to me it's like a, a schizophrenia where we're finding finding people today who in the church who will say oh you can believe the doctrines in the new testament but then you go to why you know, because the Bible says, then you go to the Old Testament. Yeah, we, you know, we believe a lot of that. You go to Genesis. Well, no. Why? Because they've been impacted by the world, impacted by the secular scientists, and they think that that overrules God's word. And we've got to put out that, that inconsistency there. And by the way, when people say that, you know, you can unhinge the Old Testament from the New Testament, the New Testament is founded in the Old Testament, and all of it ultimately is founded in Genesis 1 to 11. And you'll find that those pastors, and I know the one that you're referring to that actually uh, makes that statement about unhinging from the Old Testament, I'll guarantee they don't believe in a literal Genesis. See, you know what I find? As soon as people believe the Genesis account of creation, the fall, the flood, Tower of Babel, as written, they have no problem usually believing the rest. Mm -hmm. um, but you'll often find that those that reinterpret aspects of doctrine and scripture and say Old Testament doesn't matter and so on, they've been impacted by the world that causes them to doubt that you can trust the Bible from the very beginning because they think science has disproved this or something like that. Mm. It, it's strange in the sense that people can accept those miracles, as you mentioned before, and, and accept them by faith, but have such a hard time with the, the creation in the first 11 chapters of Genesis and yet, you know, I've never struggled with that. I, I, I mean, obviously, I mentioned before that I kind of grew up on your material uh, as a kid and, uh, and still appreciate them to this day. And it's built, still been useful to this day to explain a lot of things. But you, you'll hear people say, well, we have, we have uh, trees that are older than uh, that some people believe the world is. But the fact that God created Adam and Eve and fully grown, the fact that God created the world with plants that were fully grown, and none of these things are difficult for me to accept in a God who can actually is powerful enough to create things. Well, God certainly created a mature universe. Yeah. I mean, it was all functioning, fully functioning. So you had trees that had fruit on them and so on. And, you know, what pe many people don't understand today, when the world is interpreting what we see in the present in relation to the past, they're making all sorts of assumptions. Now, for instance, if you take trees with tree rings, they say, oh, based on tree ring dating and using the bristle pine uh, trees that are the oldest on earth, they say, you know, we go back so many thousands of years and so on. It doesn't fit with a, with a Bible chronology. But what most people don't realize is that there's assumptions like there's one growth ring per year. Uh, and then when you find different trees, they sort of overlap them, put them together and assume that they overlap at this point. And there's so many assumptions. You can actually get multiple growth rings uh, per year. Uh, so those assumptions are, are not valid. And when God made the trees, I mean, those growth rings are part of the structure of the tree. He would have put uh, growth rings in there, we would say, uh, the special structures that he put in there for uh, the tree to stand. So there's, there's so many different assumptions. And 
you know, we, we've got to recognize we were, we're living in a world that God made as a perfect world. Now it's suffered by, uh, from sin and the curse and the judgment of the flood. So there's lots of things that have happened to this world as well. We, we have to be real careful, believing people taking this present world and trying to interpret the past. You see, the philosophy of the world is the present is the key to the past. But as Christians, we should recognize that the present's not the key to the past right? Because the present, we have death and suffering all around us. The Bible is God's word, God, God's history book to us. So revelation is the key to the past and knowing what happened in the past is the key to the present. So knowing it was a perfect world marred by sin with the judgment of death, now we understand, oh, the present world is a groaning world, as Paul says in Romans 8, because of our sin. Um, there was a global flood in the past, which makes sense of why you find fossils. There was an event of the Tower of Babel, that's why we have different languages and different people groups, not different races. So we have a record from one who has told us, here's what happened in the past. God created, and this is how he created, and this is what happened to the creation. He's given us that foundation to enable us to have the right worldview to correctly understand everything in the present. Mm. I want to press into this subject. We've already sort of covered it. We've glossed over it, but I want to press into it a little more deeply because I think it's crucial to what we've been accomplishing over the course of this year, uh, breaking down various doctrines each month, really trying to understand how these, how theology and doctrine integrate into our daily life. Because there's, I think, a lot that would say, well, doctrine is for the academics. I just need to live off the basics. If we took the doctrine of creation out of our understanding of the world, how would that affect the gospel in particular? Well, if you take the doctrine of creation out, then number one, where do we come from? Mm. Are we just the product of natural processes? So then who is Jesus? Because, you know, the Bible in Colossians 1 says he's the creator. Um, and, and the fact that God created us, um, I mean, you think of what it says in Revelation, you are worthy because you have created. And then and that's Revelation 4, Revelation 5, you are worthy because you were slain. Our creator became our savior. He created us and we are finite beings and we're all sinners. He created the first man. So if you think about it, a man brought sin and death into the world. So a man would need to pay the penalty for sin and death. Um, but we're all descendants of Adam. We're all one race. We're all sinners. So none of us can pay the penalty for sin so God steps into history as the creator in the person of his son to be the perfect sinless son of God, to be our relative of our family, to be the God man, to die on a cross, be raised from the dead and offers a free gift of salvation. If he is not the creator, uh, because our creator is infinite in, in, in uh, goodness, he's, he's infinite in power, infinite in mercy, infinite in love. If our creator didn't die for us um, then how can we be saved you can't have a finite being dying for us and so it it affects the entire gospel entire understanding of of the gospel and of salvation if god is not creator if jesus who is god is not creator mm. i find this really important especially within our culture today because if if we if God did not create us, and therefore he doesn't have that uh, preeminence over us as this ownership that he created all things, all things belong to him, then it leaves us to be able to say, well, I don't really agree with God's standard of, of sin. I don't agree with his standard of righteousness. It, it allow, allows for that level of, of discussion and debate was, it seems that God is too harsh sometimes in his judgment. Why can't he let me live my life and let me be happy the way I want to be happy? But if God is owner if he is in control, if he created you, then he has that right to say what is right and what is good and what is appropriate. Well, exactly. I mean, he's the creator. He does own us. And, and you know, there's another part of this that we can't ignore. And the fact is, when you read Genesis 3, 1, when the devil came to Eve and said, did God really say? So the temptation that they gave into was to doubt the word of God. But then it says in Genesis 3, 5, you will be as God. In other words, you can be your own God. And our nature is that we don't want God telling us what to do. We want to be our own God. It's, it's part of our sin nature. Look, he has given us life. Uh, he's the one that created us. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. 
And yet we want to throw God out and say, no, I want to be my own God. But that's our sin nature. That, that's our problem that we have. And that's why we need to kneel in submission to the one who created us and who tells us what is wrong with us. And I mean, he's placed us on us the judgment of death. I mean, if you throw God out, what happens when you die? You, when you die, um, when I talked to uh, Bill Nye, when I was taking him through the Ark Encounter and debating uh, him there, I said, what happens when you die, uh, Bill? He says, when you die, you're done. And I said, if when you die, you're done, then what's the point of you arguing with Christians or creationists? Uh, because ultimately, uh, you won't even know you were here. And then he said, yeah, but maybe someone can make some great discovery or something or other. And I said, yeah, but then when they die, they're done. And he said, yeah, but they can pass on that knowledge to others who can make some discovery. And I said, yeah, but when they die, they're done. And I said, ultimately, everyone dies, everyone's done. There's no purpose, there's no meaning. It's all stupid, it's ridiculous. I mean, he, he did not have an answer to that. And the point is, the Bible makes it very clear, when we die, we're not done. And we're going to spend eternity with God or without God. And he's told us because we're sinners and rebelled against him, if we do not receive the free gift of salvation that he offers, then we will spend eternity without him. And we have to understand who God is. He created us. We rebelled. He loves us so much. He's provided a way for us uh, to come back to be with him. And he's the one that has a right to tell us uh, what is right, what is wrong, and what it means that we're a sinner and so on. So, you know, the doctrine of creation is foundational. It's foundational to everything. Mm. Can we talk a little bit about the sort of psychological, uh, uh, what was lost in, in getting God out of creation? Uh, for a believer, this lack of awe and this lack of wonder, this lack of, of comprehension of a God who can actually do big things, when we're constantly minimizing the miracles in the Bible, then who are we praying to? What are we praying about? Why, why go to God if, if our circumstances are all scientifically based? Well, yeah, there's so much you could uh, talk about uh, in, in regard to that. Um, I mean, if it, again, if, if we're just the product of natural processes, if there's no God, then why should somebody else have the same morality I do? Why shouldn't they have a different morality? Um, why can't, you know, I remember a young man come, came to me once and he said, sir, I don't believe in God. I believe um, I, I, I reject God is creator. I believe everyone has a right to do what they want to do. And I said, all right. Um, so um, if I get enough people to agree with me and we believe types like you are dangerous, we're going to eliminate you. And he said, you can't do that. I said, why not? He said, it's not right. I said, why isn't it right? He says, it's wrong. I said, why is it wrong? He said, it's not right. <laughs> um, because, you know, he had, he had no basis for his morality at all. It's just all subjective. Then everything becomes subjective. Then who decides? Uh, what anyone should believe, then everything be, become everything falls apart, uh, and, and the whole of life just just falls apart. It, you know, it's like the young man who came to me and said, "Well, I still believe we all evolve by chance, random process." And I said, "If we evolve by chance, random processes, your brain evolved by chance, random processes, right?" Yes, sir. Well, if your brain evolved, then your logic evolved by chance, random processes. Um, son, you don't know your logic evolved the right way. You don't even know if you're asking me the right question. Uh, you know, and that's when he looked at me and said, um, what was the name of that book you recommended? Uh, because he suddenly realized, hey, if, if you don't believe in God as creator and he's the absolute authority, if you reject that, then how do you, how do you know you're even asking the right things? And, you know, when, when you even look at this world, we talk about the laws of nature, the laws of mathematics, for instance, you know, um, and, and the laws of physics and uh, the, the laws in regard to astronomy and so on. But those, where do they exist? They're not material. If, if the whole universe is just a, a, a material universe and there's no supernatural, there's no God, well, of course, you know, you have to ask, well, why is it here? Where did it come from? It doesn't make any sense. Like when Bill Nye was asked by a young boy in a question, where did matter come from? He said, oh, I know it's a great mystery. Um, but, it, it, and, and where did it come from? Why is anything here? It, it makes no sense without a creator, as the Bible says, who's infinite, who's always been there, who's outside of time, who created the natural laws, which are immaterial. Otherwise, how, how do you, without a creator God, explain um, a universe where you have immaterial laws? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Mm. This idea that uh, of 
of people having a God in their own mind as kind of dualistic mindset. I'm talking about Christians now, not just the secular outsiders, but the Christians who have this idea that maybe God didn't create things, maybe science is 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 right on this front. Um, what they're left with is really a God who is stripped of all power. It's a, Maybe you can explain to our listeners a little bit about what deism is, this idea that that God is kind of limited in what he can do. Um, that that is a pretty devastating blow to the Christian's faith, is it not? Well, w- when people make up their own God, again, that's Genesis three five. You know, you can be as God. When they make up their own God, uh, the deistic God is not a personal God. Uh, is sort of like some force out there that somehow does something. Um, you know, the difference with Christianity is that we have a, a, a God who's revealed to us in his word who he is to explain who he is um, and that he is the infinite creator God. I mean, if, if it's a deistic God, who decides what God says? Then it becomes all subjective. It's sort of based on feelings. And how do you know you can trust your own feelings if it's some impersonal force uh, out there? And how do you prove that that is true? Now, people might say, well, how do you prove that uh, the, the Christian God is true. Well, we have a book that claims to be his word. He's given us very specific details about history that we can go and check. And ultimately, the Bible does say, if you come to God believing that he is, he'll reveal himself to you. So I can't, I can't prove it to you, but it's God that opens our heart uh, with the truth, and he proves it to us. But we need to come to him with, you know, without faith. It, uh, it is impossible to please God. But he comes to, to God, must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those that seek him. So there's always going to be a faith aspect. And, and you know, there, there are people out there that say, but you Christians, it's just blind faith. But it's not blind faith. It's those who don't believe in the creator God of the Bible who have blind faith. Um, in fact, it's a faith that lacks credulity. The difference with the Christian faith is a faith that makes sense of what we see, and actually science confirms what God's word says about uh, the earth and, and the universe. And, and so we have all these confirmations, uh, if you like, uh, out there, and God's word makes sense of what we see and who we are and where we came from. And, and that's the difference. Mm. One of the most compelling arguments that, that I see for the need for a young earth creation, and that's kind of one of the categories we use to describe this. Unfortunately, we have to have that catalog or a category to describe it because it's against other forms or, or views or arguments for creation. But in young earth creation, I think that one of the most compelling arguments is that you can't have death before the fall. You can't have a dying before sin came into the world. And if you do, it kind of... Un- and flips everything upside down in the context of the gospel. You know, this is a very important issue, and it really goes back to the 1800s, because in the 1800s, there were deists mm-hmm. and atheists um, who wanted to come up with a way of explaining everything by natural processes. I mean, in a way, deism is not really that different from atheism, uh, but they want to explain everything by natural processes. And so the idea was, the fossils didn't come about by a global flood. The Bible's not true. They were laid down millions of years before man. Now, the problem was much of the church said we could take the millions of years and fit in a gap between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, or we fit in the days of creation or whatever. And so the idea of millions of years has permeated much of the church and many of our Christian leaders. But if you believe in millions of years, um, number one, in the fossil record, not only is there a record of death, but there's diseases like cancer, abscesses, arthritis. If all that existed before God created man, and after he created man, he said everything he made is very good, then God's calling all that disease and death very good. Uh, number two is that then you're also taking man's beliefs and reinterpreting God's word, which means you're undermining the authority of scripture. And number three then when you look at the world today with all the death, bloodshed, disease, and suffering, you're saying that's gone on for millions of years, so God's responsible for that. But if you take God's word as written in Genesis, we're responsible because we sinned against a holy God, and now we're under the judgment of death. That's why we need a savior. And, it, you know, Jesus died on the cross. He died physically, and, and uh, uh, he was raised from the dead. But if you believe that if you believe that um, 
there was all this death and bloodshed before sin, then what does his death on the cross really mean? Uh, because there was already death and bloodshed. So, you know, the Bible says death is an enemy. It's an enemy because of our sin. And so it's important to understand that the whole foundation of the gospel, it was a perfect world. We sinned against a holy God. Death is a judgment because of our sin. That's why Jesus died on the cross to conquer death. And one day there's going to be new heavens and new earth where there'll be no more death. It'll be put back to what it was originally. In other words, a perfect world with no death or suffering. So it's really important to understand you can't, if you, if you try to add millions of years into the Bible, then you've got all this death and disease before sin. You're blaming God for death instead of blaming our sin. Mm. We're living in a world where this premise is being challenged by the mainstream media, by entertainment, by politicians, and even by our public school system. So any of our listeners are, are listening to what we're saying, and they're struggling to understand how all of this pertains to their particular life and where, where they're living and how they're going to live it out. What kind of advice do you have for them on how to navigate all of the ways that the onslaught is attacking this as the foundation of our faith? Well, you know, it is an onslaught. You're right. And uh, for those that go to public schools and secondary universities and so on, even many Christian universities, sadly, um, they're being inundated uh, with teaching of evolution and millions of years and, and also, you know, moral relativism in regard to LGBT and so on. And, you know, how do they navigate that? You know, as a Christian, I, I challenge people that if the Bible is what it claims to be, it's the word of God, then we need to stand on God's word and then use ministries like Answers and Genesis. I mean, we provide a wealth of information through our websites, through the books and, you know, our streaming service and the exhibits we have at the, at the attractions. Um, you know, you don't have to be an expert in geology, biology, astronomy. You, we have experts in those areas who do truly believe God's word. And we've given lots of answers. So we provide the material for you. So I encourage you uh, to, to research that and to find these answers because they can mean a lot to you and help you in your witnessing. And for the non-Christian, I challenge them to look at the research that our scientists have done, for instance. We've done research in all the various disciplines and we've got answers uh, to many of the questions that they have. Uh, even questions about, you know, where did God come from? How do you know there's a God? Well, you know, how do you know the Bible is true? I, I mean, all the skeptical questions and most of the skeptical questions people have today, we've had people give answers to these. And I challenge people to look at those answers. A lot of times, non-Christians don't even want to consider them. They just believe what they were taught. And I'm challenging you, stand back and have a look at what Christians are saying and what an organization like Answers and Genesis providing through all the apologetics material where we have scientists who've worked on these and give you answers that challenge the secular worldview and are saying to you, you know what, the Bible really is what it claims to be. It really is the word of God. One of the things I'm really impressed about your ministry with Answers and Genesis is that you have a, a lot of really great academics on your staff, a lot of people that have come and, and worked through the ministry. A lot of them even have come through uh, by means of, of studying creation and that being the means by which they came to Christ. I mean, it is a real, really remarkable way that, that God has used to bring people who were antagonistic against the belief that God created the world, that through their study, they've found the revelation of the true saving power of Christ. You know, I, I, for me, an analogy is the raising of Lazarus. In the New Testament, we read when Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus and he said, you know, we know Lazarus is dead. By the way, the Bible says we're dead uh, in trespasses and sin. A non-Christian is like a dead person. We're dead spiritually as a non-Christian. And Jesus says, roll away the stone. Now, Jesus could have said, stone, go away. But he said, you roll away the stone. That's sort of akin to what we do. We're rolling away the stumbling blocks. We're saying, look, we've got answers to this, to carbon dating, to, to you know, the attacks on God's word. We've got these that we're rolling the stone away, but then only Jesus could raise the dead. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. And we do all that. We provide all these apologetic answers and have the attractions to point people to the fact that God's word is true. And what does God's word say? It says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so it's only God's word that saves. I can't go out there and uh, save somebody. Only God's word saves. Uh, we're not the ones that do the saving. But what we do do is give people answers 
and continue to point them to the word of God, which is uh, the truth. And then God's word will not return unto him void. And God's word is sharper than a two-edged sword. And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, as God's word says, and believe in your heart God is raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so that's what I see our, our ministry is rolling the stone away and pointing people to the word that saves. Mm. In that regard, could I ask you to pray for our listeners, especially living in the world in which we're living, where we're facing that onslaught of, of the world's philosophy, the world's point of view, to be able to stand and to be courageous, to proclaim that we actually believe and take God's word for it as our word. Absolutely. So let's pray. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we first of all acknowledge who you are. You're the creator of the universe. You are uh, the holy God. Lord, we, we are sinners and uh, there's been such a separation between us and you because of our sin. And I think a lot of times we don't really understand what it means that uh, you are holy and righteous. And um, so we come to you and as Christians, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus, the one who died on the cross, was raised from the dead, and we come to you clothed in his righteousness, because ours, as your word says, is just filthy rags, and we can come before you, the holy God, before your throne, because we come in his name because of what he did for us. Lord, it's, it's a very difficult world we live in, and we see the attacks on Christianity today, and the attacks on, on your word, and it's, it's, it's so easy for people to succumb to what the world is doing because the pressures are so great. The world is the broad way and the narrow way we live in within the broad way is very narrow and going in the opposite direction. And more and more, we're seeing that those who truly stand on your word really stand out and they can really be attacked by those who don't want to be told what they should be doing by uh, your word and by you as uh, creator and we i just ask lord that you would uh, help people to stand boldly and unashamedly um, we remember in hebrews 11 there were people sawn in two there were people who went destitute uh, we read about some of those people of great faith we think of noah who was uh, in a time when everyone except those eight people that went on the ark everyone had rebelled against you and we're certainly not in in those days there's millions uh, that that love you even though the majority uh, have rejected your word. But I just pray that uh, you would help people to be equipped, uh, to stand boldly, to be prepared to defend uh, the Christian faith and to not waver and to know that even though the culture changes, your word never changes. And forever, oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. And for us to stand on God's word and uh, knowing that it's God who we have to answer for, to ultimately for everything we do and believe. And we pray for the leaders of this nation, that you would convict them and bring them to yourself. Because, Lord, there's so many of our leaders that certainly, uh, in rebellion against God, your word. And so we ask for them that you would open their hearts to the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We've been talking with Ken Ham from Answers in Genesis. He's also the author of many great books, as well as the books that they publish through their ministry. A great resource also with the attractions of the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum. There's a lot uh, that they have to offer on this subject, the doctrine of the creation of God. It's been a real privilege to have him with us. Ken, I can't thank you enough for uh, sharing your time with us in this ministry and encouraging us to hold fast to the doctrines of our faith. Hey, thanks, Adam. Anytime.